Hello everyone, my name is Michael Evans and this is 10 lessons I learned in 2022. If you don't know who I am, I'm a science fiction thriller author, I'm a student at Harvard and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ream, which is a subscription platform by fiction authors for fiction authors. Now we got the official stuff out of the way, so let, let's dive into what was an adventure this last year. But before I actually share with you the lessons, which I've got them written out here, I've got some notes just to kind of cement this reflection to box it in, structure it, you know what I mean? I want to share who this will be helpful for. I think if you are an author or a creator, this will be very helpful to you because you will hear a lot about my personal journey as an author and how that has evolved throughout the year. If you are a student, I think this will also really help you because I'm a student. I started this year at 19 years old and ended at 20, which is weird because I'm not a teenager anymore. But regardless, I have some insights for you, maybe, potentially. And then if you're an entrepreneur or a business person, then this might also be useful to you because I am an entrepreneur. I guess this is now the journey of me starting my third tech company this year. So there's been a lot of interesting things going on. So if you're all three of those things, a student, a creator, and an entrepreneur, then you're gonna probably love this video. And we should like talk, because you're, you're one of me. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, I do wanna say that these are just lessons that I had from the year, and I'm not saying they're prescriptive for everyone. People might live by different lessons, and that's completely okay. And also, if you're wondering what I've been up to, the last year. If you're someone who's followed me on YouTube or my books throughout the years, if you are one of our wonderful authors and descriptions for authors community, or someone who's been excited about Ream, or just someone in my life, like a real life friend who's like, dude, I have no idea what you do with all your time, then you'll get a lot of insights into that. And I just want to first start with lesson number one. And I'll go through these and share some stories and insights in my life that are kind of relevant to each lesson, how I came to learn it. And the first one is life is about the moments. And this one is something I think we all deep down inside know, but I think we always need a reminder of it. And it's why I'm putting this up at top because I don't know if there's anything more profound that can shape all of our experiences and how we perceive the world. We're always trying to go to that next thing maybe doing things to achieve something, to capture it on a camera like I'm doing now. But in reality, the moment itself is all we'll ever have. And those memories are priceless. And the people, the places, and the things that we experience, we never can really get back. And I had a few big reminders this year about that. So first one was I had two people I deeply care about in the writing community who passed away. One of them, was actually going to advise us on Reem, which you'll hear a lot more about Reem if that's like something you don't know about. Uh, and uh, he died way too young, died in a car crash, science fiction author. And yeah, it broke my heart. I was a reader of his, I loved his books, and also was looking forward to like working with him. And it just didn't, d didn't happen. It's not gonna happen, it never will happen. And then another friend, of mine. Uh, his name is Gary Collins. I met him at 20 Books 2019. He was like my first author friend. Um, technically, I guess Adam Fuller was. He invited me out to dinner with him and Gary Collins, who he was co writing a series with. And Gary's a wild dude. He had a podcast, he lived off the grid. And I just admired that he like wanted to share his views with the world. I admired that he was like out here living this like very interesting lifestyle. Uh, ended up visiting both his homes in 2021 on a long road trip I went on, which the prior years will be other videos, but 2021 was definitely a, a ride of the year as well. But he passed away uh, really unexpectedly uh, and totally broke my heart. So the fact that them two are gone was, was a, a big reminder for me. And then the other one was kind of sparked by something that happened last year. But uh, with my grandma passing away, I told my grandpa, like, why don't we go on an adventure this year? Why don't we go on an adventure? So we ended up going to the Galapagos Islands. 
And let me tell you, it was one of the most beautiful, incredible things I've ever experienced. And just recently, because it's, it's actually Christmas Eve now, I was printing out pictures for him for his Christmas present of our time together. Like just getting them like blown up, made into like, um, they call it like canvases and things like that. And it just brings me back to the moment where I was like, wow, spring break was coming up in college. I had saved up some money from my time live streaming. Uh, did that for a thousand hours in 2021. And I was like, why not spend it on an amazing experience? And I couldn't think about a better experience and a better person to do it with than my grandpa. So we planned out this vacation, we did it. We went on a cruise there and it doesn't even feel like real to me looking back at it. And we ended up meeting someone in the middle of that trip named Hans, who I love you, Hans, if you're watching this. And Hans has now become a big part of my life because later, me and my grandpa over the summer, as I was starting Reem, I really wanted to throw myself or immerse myself back into the writing community because COVID shut down a lot of in-person events and, and rightfully so. And I had kind of taken a break from writing to go into YouTube, live streaming, and the world of technology startups. I wanted to go back and just ground myself in the world of being an author because I've always been an author, I've always been writing, but there's something different about being there with people, about shaking their hands, about having those conversations with no agenda in mind just to make friends. And I ended up traveling to Europe twice that summer and the first time I traveled out there, my grandpa came with me and I had a conference in Madrid in the end, but I went to also two dinners uh, related to 20 Books, which is a big writer's group called 20 Books 50K. Went to it in Oxford and I went to it, uh, I think in Cardiff. And in between those dinners and the Madrid conference, we went to Paris, we went to Amsterdam. And when we were in Amsterdam, we got to see Hans, who we met on the cruise ship in Galapagos Islands. And what brings this story even crazier is that I saw him again when we went to Las Vegas. And we're gonna talk a bit more about people soon because I have another big lesson on people. But our paths just crossed this year. And these moments that I have with Hans, like he just comes up in these moments of life where he just reminds me like, wow, I can't believe you're here again. Love hanging out with you. And it just reminds me how every moment in life is like this beautiful uncertainty and is a surprise in a sense. And it was so amazing to be able to, again, like have that space to be able to spend time with him and, and be able to have these memories with my grandpa. You know, nothing ever will, will amount or like quantify that, right? Like they're with me forever and, and those are the moments that matter. And there's countless more moments throughout the year, but. Those, those are some of them that really stick out to me and remind me like every day that we don't wanna get caught up in the news in, in these big meta narratives that can consume us in this whole big world that we can't really control when in reality like these moments that we have, the people we love, doing the things we love, like that's what matters. Those are the powerful things and I'm so grateful this year I got to have that but it also took an investment, an investment of time, an investment of money, a lot of money on my part, and it was something that was more than worth it. But we have to invest in these experiences. We have to invest in these people. We have to invest in these moments. Because if we don't carve out space for ourselves to have this time, to have this space in our lives, we're not gonna ever really be able to actually capture these things, not with a camera, but with our hearts, with our souls. And this is why probably the biggest reason why I go to therapy every week. Uh, I started going to therapy every week about a year and a half ago. And it, it just carves out space every week where I now need to be in the moment and to think about what I'm going through, what my mind's battling. And I found that very helpful. So to, to pull space out in so many different areas of your life and just to be in the moment, to be present, it's worth a lot. It's the most important thing. And it's what's made 2022 such a grounding year for me, a uh, very stable year overall. Um, internally and a very happy one. And if I didn't create that space, even with all the ups and downs and all the exciting things that were accomplished, I don't think I would have felt any better. So yeah, that's a big one.
and definitely one that I, I think I learned the hard way in 2021. And this year learned the fun way, which was by doing it and by creating that space for those moments, which has been incredible. And the second one is that the world is bigger, yet smaller than you think. And, and for this, I want to bring in Reem because for those who don't know, Reem is essentially a better version of Patreon for fiction authors. We've been working on it for now almost a year. Me, Amelia Rose, and Sean Patton. And it's been a ton of fun. We're all co-founders in it, and we've not only worked on it ourselves, but now with like hundreds and hundreds of authors who've supported us throughout this process and giving us feedback, just chatting with us, and giving us really the energy to fuel this vision to try and create a better future for fiction authors and readers. The world, that storyteller's world, that's what we wanna do. But, you know, starting out a year ago, this wasn't even a thing. You know, I, I didn't know this was going to be a thing. And how I even got connected to it was literally by emailing someone who ran another company in the publishing space that I was interested in. And then that person ended up knowing Amelia Rose. And she was kind of the lead author for that company. And all of a sudden he was recruiting me to be the CEO of the company, which was so weird. And it was just like such a small world. And when me and Amelia got to meet each other, we were like, I think, I think like we should work together. And we should work together with Sean, who's actually Amelia's husband, and like build, build this, build this vision that we have. Starting with, yeah, let's build a better subscription platform for fiction authors, especially because Amelia's been doing subscriptions for the last three years and she taught me so much and really cemented this this vision that I had for the creator Connie for authors and what was possible and brought to life how we could take you know these steps forward to make it happen today and, and she'd already been doing that in many ways for her readers but it was difficult um, with the way that these platforms worked time-consuming uh, not really built for her as an author so that's what we wanted to do with Reem and not only was Amelia one step away from a random person, right? Every single person like I've like dreamed of meeting or working with, I've somehow connected with in the last year. I was on a mailing list for Khan and Samir, who run this basically like YouTube channel that helps creators and they sent out an email that was saying, hey, do you want like five free tickets to this conference called Creator Economy Expo? Like click this button and enter the raffle. And they have like a million subscribers and on the mailing list specifically had like tens of thousands of people. I was like, there's no way, there's no way I'm gonna like get this, right? There's just no way. I ended up getting it. I ended up like being a part of the raffle. So I flew out to Phoenix. It was one of nine conferences I went to last year. Yeah, I went to nine conferences. That's a whole other story. Um, and all of them were like writing and creator related. And it was out there, super interesting experience. It was in Arizona. My first book was written in Arizona. It's a fiction book, um, but it was set there. It was a dystopian novel. So it was kind of cool to be back. And when I was there, first day, I ended up meeting Joanna Penn. And I like saw her like, in the restaurant uh, for, I think it was called, what is it? Oh, In-N-Out. Why was I forgetting that? It was like in In-N-Out. I, I swear, it must have been In-N-Out or something like that. It was like a fast food restaurant. It was just right outside of the hotel that like the comments hadn't started yet. And I see her talking with like Jay Thorne and I knew them both. I recognized them from like online. I didn't know them personally. So I was like kind of nervous. I'm like, should I go talk to them? I'm like, screw it, I'm gonna go up to them. And I just said, hey, my name is Michael, and you know, I've followed you guys' work for years. You inspired me to be a writer. I've been publishing at the time. I'd been publishing for almost five years. Now it's officially been five years. Um, and yeah, thank you for like inspiring me and totally changing my life. And we ended up sitting and talking. And I probably chatted with them for like four hours during the conference throughout those next few days. Really got to know them. And, and she's like definitely an idol of mine. And it was so cool. And 
that just happened like completely randomly. There was no other authors at this conference. This was very much a creator economy focused conference, a lot of marketers, a lot of people in the B2B world. So I just wasn't expecting to see her there. But it was really cool. We we're just both two attendees to an interesting conference that we thought, you know, was definitely a good place for us to be. And that just showed me that like this world is so big in terms of the amount of opportunity. Like there's things that you never even thought possible, events that you never even thought could happen that exist in this world that people are creating and that you can be a part of. And that then when you go and do these things, all these people that you thought were so far away from you, that were so inaccessible, are really just one step away. You're like one, one or two stone throws away, um, one or two degrees away from almost everyone you care about. And this is wrong, true and true again. And the author community, as we've rolled out Ream, we haven't really like officially like marketed anything. We've just had a podcast that we haven't explicitly made a call like go listen to it. We've just Post it in the Facebook group, post it in our newsletter. And things have slowly grown there, like beyond uh, what we could imagine. And we're so thankful for you if you're an author listening who shared Ream with your friends. Like, that means so much. And that just shows the power that, like, every one you care about is one stone throw away from another person you care about. And this really, like, shown through to me in a book that Joe Solari wrote called Advantage. It really confirmed a lot of these things I was thinking about, where I was like, yes, Joe, you're, you're completely right. And he talked a lot about, you know, network analysis, a lot of sociological concepts and behavioral psychology. And it, and it just really made me like realize like, yes, this world is such a small place. And as humans, we're so beautifully interconnected, yet it is so big. I traveled like 30,000 miles this year. Like I said, I went, I went to Europe for first time ever in my life, went international for the first time ever, went to Galapagos too. I've never traveled internationally. Um, and that was insane. I've been able to meet people all over this country and been able to email people too and cold email founders and people at companies I never would have imagined speaking to who have completely influenced my my way of thinking, my way of life. Some incredibly inspiring people. So yeah, it's very, very interesting how big yet small the world is. Like literally I was just on Twitter one day like in January beginning of this year and I emailed this guy who runs like a law a legal tech startup for creators and was like hey like can I help you out and I never knew like that was even a possibility like that's how big the world is there's so many people working on interesting things but you just DM him and then there you go we get to work together on this I worked with him for a couple months and then Reem really started to pick up and around like maybe the springtime we were like we're gonna go all in on it but I've maintained a friendship with him uh, his name's Eric Farber and I've loved that so it's just crazy, like, again, how small the world is, especially when you want to pursue your passion. Like, everyone's there. Everyone's there. Yet also, how much more is possible than you ever could imagine? Than you ever could imagine. And this goes on to my third lesson, which is about time, perseverance, failure, is that things can take so much time to even come together. So much time to even get to a point where it's working and you might feel like you're failing over and over and over again when you're really not you're really not failing this happened for me in prior years like a super quick run-up of the failures before this year was that I started a publishing company at 15 to publish my own science fiction novels uh, ended up putting well over ten thousand dollars out of pocket into it and got completely burnt out of publishing 12 books I went to college I started a YouTube channel the YouTube channel got about 9,000 subscribers in maybe two months. I was able to make a couple thousand dollars just in a short period of time. But from there, the channel ended up not doing as well for many reasons I could get into other things. I started a new channel, and that new channel, although we met a lot of interesting people from some of the biggest YouTubers on the planet, like Eric, to some people who are really close friends of mine today, ended up also not working out then i had like a live streaming deal with a startup that was like a success yet the startup completely failed and flopped and all my thousand hours i spent on the startup never went anywhere At the same time i founded my own company it was focused on creator discovery that was trying to help basically creative people and super fans of creators support creators by creating content on the internet it ended up uh not working out when my co-founders left in the middle so that was 
we bootstrapped that and self-funded it. So that was uh, not a fun hit. Uh, and then I got asked to join the co-founding team of another company called, at, I won't even share the company name. I shouldn't share the company name. Uh, but I will say a prominent YouTuber invested in them as an angel investor. And it was a social reading startup. Um, and I was asked to join as a co-founder and the CEO completely abandoned the startup, ghosted me, and was not a great experience, put it that way. And that was going into like a year ago. Like this was a year ago today, pretty much. Those were like all the failures I was coming off of. Like my only success I had was like somehow luckily getting into Harvard, which was which was cool, obviously. That was a, a really cool thing, but it never felt like anything I wanted worked out because I never wanted Harvard. It was, it was something that I never really dreamed about. I dreamed about being an author. I dreamed about being a storyteller, a creator, an entrepreneur. And all these things I wanted kept flopping. And I was definitely losing energy. Um, I was definitely feeling a bit defeated. And then, again, not only did I meet Amelia and Sean, but things finally started to, to kind of like come together. But they came together in a way in which they built completely on all my prior experiences. Like without those failures, without those missteps, without at this point one, two, three, four, easily five failed like business endeavors that either I directly founded and directly put my money into or two instances in which it was like, you know, not my money uh, in a sense. I was going to join teams or I was working with another team that we also completely failed. That's like so debilitating. Like. It was, it was, it was like, I felt like such a failure, but I spent the end of 2021 going into 2022, just collecting myself and realizing like, no, this is part of it. This is part of my learning process. And I just kept drilling that into me. And I don't know if I was right at all. I might still fail for the next five or 10 years, everything I do uh, in the sense of having it be a sustainable business, having it be a sustainable uh, venture for me. But finally this year, it was the first time in which there was like real serious traction on anything I did. And something that I did that was so much more um, profound, working with a better team of people, working on a mission I was more passionate about than I ever have been. So it was like, it's not this zero sum game where, oh, you lost it on one opportunity, now the next is gonna be worse. It's that, that's the only option you'll ever get. It's like, no, no, there's so much, uh, this world's so big, there's so much out there that if you continue persevering, if you continue following your passion, working hard, learning, and doing all the things that other people tell you not to do, all in the meaning like everyone else will tell you, short, you know, term thinking, you know, you'll blow up overnight. Like that's the thinking we all get obsessed about. But if you just focus on the long term, building skills, building relationships, building networks, it's insane how these things can just build on itself. This knowledge, and that goes in to my fourth lesson, which is that compound interest is everything. And I didn't understand just how powerful this was. I've always been a futurist, a long-term thinker, I wrote science fiction. But lesson number four, compound interest is everything, everything. I didn't realize that this isn't true necessarily like about just putting compound interest in the stock market. Knowledge compounds, relationships compound, capital in a business compounds, networks compound, everything compounds. Quality of work compounds, fan bases compound, word of mouth compounds. All of it, all of it, over a period of time, over a long period, can get there. And it's just about how can I do something one to two percent better every month? If you can do something one to two percent better every month, you will make tremendous progress over the course of five to ten years. You'll be doing things an order of magnitude better than you know, any of your quote unquote competition um, or any other like the typical story, the typical author business, the typical publishing business, the typical tech startup, whatever you're doing, you will do it that much better. If you're trying to be a great chemist, one to 2% do just that little bit better than the than that standard. And you will slowly continue to compound that. And it's just incredible how it works. So. I think we talked a bit about compound interest and lesson five is an interesting one for me, which is that status games are inescapable, uh, but dangerous. 
and we should really watch ourselves when we feel like we're starting to play a status game. We feel like we're doing something for status. And for me, this is why I switched my major, realizing this. And it's also why I completely switched around my YouTube strategy by privating all my prior videos. And what I realized is that I was doing things because I felt like I needed validation externally. I wanted people to look at me and be like, oh, you know, he's obviously a real creator. You know, he's successful because he has a certain ranking on the Amazon store. He has a certain number of reviews. Uh, he has a certain number of subscribers on YouTube. And I thought that would validate me and that would magically give me, you know, the credibility I needed to do what I really want, which is to empower storytellers to pursue a different path uh, that works for them in the creator economy and to build tools, platforms, and networks, and also create educational content that shares all the mistakes and lessons and successes I've had uh, and tries to share that from other authors that I meet constantly and just trying to help storytellers build a better future for themselves and their readers. Like that's what I want to do. That was my passion. That was my mission. But I felt like I needed to, again, have this extra validation. So what did that mean for me? It meant that I was like spending a lot of this year, more time than I should have, not like a ton of time, maybe like 15 to 20 hours. Uh, and then also a lot of mental bandwidth, just like while driving around or thinking about things about my books and wanting to figure out how I could like market them to get them up in the ranks and make it feel like, oh, like I have some credibility. You know, I'm doing that. And I felt the same way about YouTube. I wanted to like release my YouTube videos. I filmed a hundred vlogs over the last two and a half years of my life. And if you look on my YouTube channel, there's one video that's live. So I had uploaded maybe 30 or 40, but I wanted to go through and just edit all the other ones and get them to do well um, and build some momentum so I could go like, look, I have this YouTube audience. But in reality, I didn't want to be a YouTuber. I didn't even want to necessarily be like an author who's selling books. I want to be an author creator who's building a new world for authors to create stories and run their business and interact with their readers. I want to create a whole new way of doing things. and. I was like stuck again trying to like play the status game of how can I get people to like me? How can I feel good enough by being validated by these systems? And I felt the same thing with school and it was school that actually like made me realize what I was doing in the other areas of my life, which was that I originally wanted to go to college and be a history and science major, which was kind of like a more liberal arts. You take some science classes, you take some more history of science classes, and you get a more broad based view of like how technology in the future works. And I was like, cool, that sounds nice to me as a science fiction author. But then I was like, I mentioned an addiction, you know, growing up, my dad's a sports gambler. So uh, addiction, very pa passionate about that, uh, specifically about watching all the things going on with like the intersection of like digital media and addiction and digital media and gambling addiction, total mess. And it's something I'm really passionate about. In fact, if beyond Reem, that might be the next thing I, I work on. And I just remember thinking to myself, neuroscience, that would be cool. What if I studied neuroscience? Like I would then be a scientist, right? I would be considered a scientist. And in the science fiction community, that could be like a really good thing. Like people would recognize me as someone who isn't just writing about science, but also who knows science. I wanted that status. So I took 40 credits this year, a lot of them towards my neuroscience degree. Um, so 40 credits like during the calendar year, uh, the school year, um, obviously I'm still in the middle of one. Uh, I'm a junior now, five semesters into school. But yeah, I finally realized after like sitting in neuroscience class and being like, yeah, like I like this, but I don't want to like completely do this. Like I like some of my other class. I like the, the history and science thing more. I like science and technology studies more than neuroscience. I realized like, why am I really doing this? Like what motivated this? And it was clear to me that I was trying to play a status game. And that's when I realized, well, what other areas of my life am I doing this in? What other areas of my life am I trying to, to play a game of sorts that I should really try and take a step back and, and refocus around what I really want to do? And, and that's when I immediately looked to how I was approaching books and how I was approaching um, my YouTube, which I then kind of changed that around. And that's been very useful to me. And it's also helped, again, for me to see, like, where do I want to be five or ten years from now? And yeah, where I want to be five or 10 years from now is 
having built a, a home for authors to be able to connect with their readers and build worlds around what they're doing to power a thousand, 10,000 mini Disney's. Like I'd much rather accomplish that than anything else, which goes in to lesson number, uh, oh, that's not a neat number. I didn't write that neat, but this is lesson number, I believe six now, which is that you have to give yourself permission to focus. And I finally did that this year. For most of my life, I was focused on doing really, really well at school and trying to do really, really well with like writing books. And I also had a job uh, at a local resort to like be able to fund the publication of the books. And then college rolls around and schooling, like doing really, really well at school was less important to me. I was more focused on like meeting people and at the time writing books, a YouTube channel, then it was YouTube live streaming and running a startup. And then it was trying to do books, start up all this stuff. And I finally realized like, wait, wait, dude, I need to focus on what I really care about. And what I really care about is solving all the problems that I found for myself in the digital media space, which is where Reem came in. But I, for the longest time, thought I needed to be doing a million things and exercising all of my different passions. When in reality, like focus has been a game changer for me. It has enabled me to have more space for myself, to have less like worries, less things in my plate and do the things I'm doing so much better to like go further faster because I focused, I focused on it and not focused on a result, not focused on an outcome, but focused on an ethos and a mission that I'm passionate about. And that's something that I never gave myself the privilege to do. And part of it was because I was trying to figure out what I really wanted. Um, part of myself was also, again, trying to think in the short term. I wanted to get somewhere and I was so focused on the destination that I wasn't focusing on the moment. I was focusing on the results and I really should have just been, again, focusing on the process. But focusing on the process has completely changed my life. And it really inspired me uh, to just stop like listening to the noise because like noise takes you away from focus. So I haven't read much of the news this year. I haven't been using social media really at all outside of my Facebook group for the subscriptions for authors community. And it's been great. Like we have a space for us authors to connect that we all get to be a part of. And that feels like a very healthy space for me to focus on. And I hope for some of y'all, but no longer did I feel this pressure to need to keep up with things, to need to be on top of the news and what is this company doing and what is this? No, 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 no. I just wanna focus on the people I care about, the people I love, the, th the thing that I love and like providing value to them, making their life better. And everything else kind of is a distraction in that, right? So that's kind of what I realized. And I realized like these results, these numbers that we get ourselves caught up in also doesn't really matter to me. Like who cares if the click through rate's 1% or 100 people watch it, or the click-through rate's 1,000, uh, sorry, 10% and 1,000 people watch it, when I just wanna like create an experience that's valuable to at least one person. And if me focusing on a number is going to like stop me from creating an experience that's valuable, then why would I do that? If me focusing on a revenue number for my books takes the joy out of it, why am I going to do that? If me focusing on you know, a revenue number for Reem makes us not do what's best for authors, then why would I do that? That's why we're bootstrapped. We own our own company so that we can stick true to our values and our community. And most people just don't do this. Most people like either they literally get bought out by other people, like they take on investors, um, they they kind of parlay themselves to the interests of other people. If they don't do that by by like legality, by like structure, then they do that by choice. Then they'll say, oh well it's this person's way of life. It's this person's um, things I need to focus on. But when you really should just focus on yourself and the people you love and allow yourself to have that space. I finally did that this year. And it's not like I haven't, like I've had to live my normal life. I've had to go to school. Uh, there, it's not like you can just focus on the one thing you wanna do, but that's the only way you can get there, right? The only way you can get there is like by building relationships and value for people you really care about. And that goes into lesson number seven which is kind of about how you create that value, which is that Renaissance people are the future. And a Renaissance people, I think, are people who are generalists, who are knowing a little bit about a lot of things, and that 
can build really interesting things and experiences for people. And I think we're gonna continue seeing people who, and instead of focusing on a very specialized career path that we've kind of been told to do, or hyper-focusing on doing one little, little thing, um, people who have generalist skills, who can build worlds for the people they care about, worlds that they're passionate about, I think are gonna continue like finding success. And this year, I realized that all of these like skills that I had built in video editing, digital advertising, marketing, community building, live streaming, science fiction, world building, technology, all of that coalesced into like, first of all, being able to write my first nonfiction book called Creator Economy for Authors, which I never imagined writing a guide to the future of publishing, but being able to have all this broad-based knowledge and experience allowed me to create a story that can hopefully start to give other people some of that experience. And it's also enabled me to be able to like actually work on Ream because I am able to have that sort of vision and that long-term view. And if you're an author and entrepreneur, we all have to be the CEOs of our own publishing companies, right? And if you wanna be the CEO, you kind of have to know what's going on in each department, even if you're running the department or you're outsourcing a software to automate it or a contractor to do it for you, like you still need to kind of know. And this is true as well for obviously people who are, are students too, because if you, the world's changing so much that being able to have this kind of broad-based view of things, I think really helps you um, not get pigeonholed into doing one thing that you might not like or having one narrow view of your career that you're like, wait, actually, there's different ways to do this thing that I love that might provide more value to more people. And that's what I've realized about like my evolution from starting off as a science fiction author to a YouTuber, to a live streamer, to a, to a startup founder, to now working on Ring. Like that evolution has directly come from realizing more and more the things that I love, my passions can evolve to again, be in areas that provide more value to more people. I'm gonna turn on that light. And lesson number eight, this one I think is really important. And it's just about putting people first. People first. I like to say readers first if you're an author. When you put people and their needs first, let them talk before you talk. Put their needs before your needs. That's how you get the world to take care of you. And now, I'm all for like the mask thing. You know, get the air mask on on the airplane before you put on other people's action mask. That's important. But what I think is equally important is to not go through life being selfish and greedy and expecting the world to give you things. I see too many people do that, and I've never been that kind of person. But what I've also never realized is just how powerful giving is. Giving with no expectation, just for the world, for the good of people, by elevating the reader experience, the experience of the people around you, your experience above any sort of quantitative metric. Elevating that experience, that feeling above all else is the most human thing we can do and is the most beneficial thing we can do. And I've started doing that this year and seeing all of the powerful things. I've seen all the people I've been able to connect with and just by saying like, how can I, again, put someone else's experience first? How can I create something that isn't focused on serving my interests, but serving someone else? And this has led to me building the most deep relationships and friendships of my life this year. From people like Susie Webster, who run an amazing conference, Lost Low Country in South Carolina for romance authors, to even people on like teams that I never would have expected even like caring about what I had to say, like people like the SPF guys, like just recently have been able to start helping them out with some things. That's been so cool to be able to like work with other people I like consider my idols. It's been really cool to be able to help, again, communities that I care about. I, I actually made like a, a video for the 20 books uh, to 50K, which hopefully gets released at some point. That's like a promo video for the conference. And it was just so gratifying to like sit there and be doing that. Like nothing meant more to me than putting like authors I care about first and helping like invite new authors into that community, which I think is valuable um, to them. And it just meant a lot to me. And I think that when you kind of have that mindset in life, things just come your way that end up being so much more enjoyable. 
you have to open up your mind and think, what are all the different ways I can, again, put readers first? And you realize that like books are just the beginning, like stories simulate empathy at scale. And there's so many different things we could do with that. Lesson number nine is you can't do it all. This goes in the focus point, but this is a bit deeper about me being super, super hard on myself. I, this year, tried to be like a full-time neuroscience student. I tried to run a company. I wrote two books this year, one fiction, one nonfiction book. And on top of that, I wanted to run a media brand. I wanted to do the podcast, the Facebook group. It was a lot. It was a lot. And going into next year, I've pared down what I'm doing to again, really focus on authors. But this year I hadn't really come into it with that full mindset yet. I didn't come into that full mindset to like 100% focus on reading. It was like maybe 80, 20. And it was a lot, like a lot. And like next semester in school, I have like one and a half classes. Everything else is focused on reading. So like being able to have that space is gonna make such a difference. But trying to like put that pressure on myself every day to show up, be working every minute, to constantly be on the clock was not always the best move because it sometimes made me lose sight of those little moments. And you kind of have to be like, give yourself permission at some point to like not hit all of your goals, to not feel like you have to do everything and everything all at once. Like things come with time. And I've realized that like, I'd rather like just enjoy the process and enjoy who I'm being around and not have to move at a hundred million miles per hour rather than being in a state where I feel like I'm in a constant race to keep up with time and a to-do list. And I think as like authors and entrepreneurs and even students who like we're super busy people, we have a lot on our plate and also have a lot of agency to choose what we want to put in our plate in terms of our class load, in terms of what classes we take in terms of what books we write and how many in terms of what business we work on and how much like i just realized like i am constantly wanting to push myself to the edge and i need to like not do that i need to not do that because like if you're constantly pushing yourself to the edge um yes i take days off yes i get good sleep yes i take care of myself yes i work out all the time so you like check all these boxes off and go like, oh, I'm taking care of myself. Like, I'm good. You know, so I learned that. Like, okay, I gotta go to therapy every week. I gotta do this, I gotta do this. I gotta like check off all these boxes. I can't neglect myself. So I'll have these other boxes that I also wanna go all in on. But when life becomes a game of check boxes, it's not, it's not what I'm looking for. So I realized I need to actually give myself permission to have more flexibility, to take some things off my plate so that not everything has to become a check box, but instead just living in the moment of doing what matters most to me next. And I do matter to me, so that doesn't mean I neglect to sleep or taking care of myself, but it does look differently than this regimented schedule of check boxes. And I've learned to kind of move away from that. And lesson number 10, because we're finally at lesson number 10, finally, and as it's like getting dark behind me, is knowing who and how to trust. This might be the biggest one, it's a really difficult one, I've had a lot of people in my life burn my trust in my personal life, uh, from really close family members to people in work situations. And I've also had people like, when I've begun to trust them, be the best partners and add more richness to my life than anyone else. So how do you like trust people? How do you trust people? And what I've learned is that Systems to validate trust are essential. Technology can actually play a role in these systems. Texting, for instance, relies on a lot of protocols that help us to ensure that, oh, that person texted that, that's what they meant. It's in the text, right? Um, but everything we do has these systems from miles per hour in a car, speed limits, regulations, etc. right? And I think that when it comes to our personal lives, when it comes to like our relationships with people, you sometimes have to take a risk and know that some people are sometimes gonna burn your trust just because if you don't trust anyone, you can start to get into the vibe where you feel like you have to do everything yourself 
And now we get back to that dangerous position of like doing it all yourself. And meanwhile, like doing it together is so much better. Being working on teams with people, inviting people into your vision, inviting people into your life is the most beautiful thing. It's what we all crave as people, inviting people into your community. And you sometimes just have to trust that like people are gonna judge me for this. People want to hear what I have to say. People aren't gonna get mad at me. People aren't gonna hate me for this. People aren't going to screw me over. Like, the world is net good. One way that we've like wanted to build mutual trust in the Facebook group is by having post approval turned off. It's very common that a lot of Facebook groups post approvals turned on. Maybe one day we'll have to do that, but we've turned it off because we wanna trust people to create things that they care about. And it's been so cool to see that like we haven't really had to ban much posts at all. And that shows me that like you bring a group of people together that are kind of like mostly strangers and in the group get to know each other and like look what is possible. Like look what is possible when you just bring people together. And you have to trust yourself and trust the world enough to do that. And it's something that for me like growing up like I live in Charleston, South Carolina, but growing up in Long Island, New York, not you know you don't you're not always growing up to trust people there. But it was a big lesson for me to learn in 2022. And just to wrap things up in this video, I will give like a rundown of like what I kind of did this year, what I accomplished. Because I know some of you might be interested in that. I kind of alluded to some things. I didn't want to like make this like a, a video about like what I did this year. But I think some of you might be genuinely interested and might learn from it. So this year, um, I met the co-founders for Reem, uh, Amelia, and Sean. We built the MVP, mainly Sean, who's a software developer. We built our initial community attended nine conferences throughout the year. I attended a uh, speculative fiction conference online, uh, Creator Economy Expo. I attended uh, AWP. I attended um, Grub Street. I attended uh, 20 Books 50K Vegas. I attended um, Romance Con slash Lust in the Colo Country, uh, 20 Books 50K Madrid, uh, SPF London. And I feel like there's something else that I'm missing, but that's probably most of it. Uh, so I attended a lot of conferences. I took a course this year, uh, totally outside of school. It was called Creator Now. Uh, that's focused on helping creators. I read about 50 books. I should probably do a whole separate video about the books I read and what that taught me. Um, actually, maybe was it was it 50? I'm trying to think. If if I count like it was definitely like 30, but I haven't like done a list yet. I've definitely read like 50 books worth of content, but a lot of the things I read were like excerpts from books for one of my classes in particular. So I could probably run, do a rundown of like the top 25 or 30 books I read this year. Um, split between fiction and nonfiction. I ended up writing, like I said, two books, starting a new one. I uh, ended up creating 25 podcast episodes. Um, I'm a co-host for the Young Eager Writers podcast, so we did that. I also co-host Subscriptions for Authors podcast. We did that. I had uh, my work published in like other publications, a blog post for the first time this year. I had one post in Self-Publishing Formula, one post in The Tilt. Um, yeah, uh, next year gearing up to release the two books I wrote this year. I hope to write one other fiction and one other non-fiction book next year. Um, Excited for the launch of Ream and to see how that goes. Our goal is just to like support our first authors in the year and make the platform better. Hopefully by also releasing audio and comic books native to the platform. Uh, I released some YouTube videos this summer but ended up taking them down because I did the whole refocus thing that we chatted about. I mentioned this but I took- And yeah, I think that's most of the year. Traveled like 30,000 miles-ish went obviously to Europe, Arizona, Detroit was like at the very end of last year. Kind of count that this year. Um, yeah, I met like some of the best people in my life this year. Too many people to count, too many people to even name. A lot of people in the creator economy, a lot of, a lot of awesome creators, a lot of awesome authors and people in the publishing industry. <sighs> yeah, it was honestly the best year of my life. Best year of my life. Yet, at the surface, not much happened. I didn't, I made like, 
basically like no money or tangible results from anything I did this year and I'm totally okay with that. That wasn't the goal. Like it was the best year of my life even though like that wasn't like this wasn't the year that I you, I'll look back like oh like my life like that's the year things exploded like on the outside like no one would be like oh like wow like it felt like an overnight success like that, that didn't happen this year but like when people if that one day ever happens to me you know, a book does really well whatever I'll look back to years like this and be like it was not overnight like years like this were the work that went in where where I just like grinded at it and had a ton of fun that like I can't even it was so awesome it was the first year that I think I've consistently been happy like consistently I had very few like sad days this year and it was all because of like the headspace I'm in and what I'm working on and the balance that I've gotten myself into. I've been in a good creative flow, a good workflow process. So yeah, I mean, overall, banner year and great for everyone who's made it that way because it would be nothing without the people involved. And super excited for what's next, what's to come. So yeah, I guess this is my 10 lessons in 2022. I might make this an annual thing. I don't know if this was a good video or not. It may have been crap, but let me know if you liked it. Um, I might create more of these. I know this is super open, maybe not like very scripted or like on point, but I think that was kind of the idea. I wanted to kind of riff off the top of my mind with these 10 lessons as points that I know I wanted to hit. Even though it's been a happy year, it's definitely been a challenging year. I've worked harder, maybe not than ever, but like damn near close to it. Like worked myself to capacity many, many moments. Um, had some lows with losing people I care about. Um, and also like facing some emotional challenges of like doubt, will this work? I still have questions about will anything I'm doing actually work, but you know, we're going to try and provide the best experiences to people and I hope they like it. I hope, but you know, you never really know until it's out in the world, no matter whether it's a story or a technology product or whatever you're working on. So that, that to me is something that I've had to battle. I've had to battle you know, these status games and, and, and wanting to really do something for myself and what I believe in and not what I feel like the world forces me into. I want to create a new world and empower myself to do that, empower my authors to do that. And that requires me sticking to that ethos. And it's difficult. It's the thing I have to show up every day and do. Um, loving myself is a constant challenge to feel like I'm good enough. But this is the first year of my life where I haven't felt like I'm constantly inadequate. I haven't felt insecure. I haven't questioned when I text people, when I communicate people, if they're constantly judging me. I know it's weird, but I, I used to do that. And it was just because I always thought like, are they gonna think I'm weird? Are they gonna think this isn't right? But I just realized after putting myself out there and, and reflecting and, and grounding myself more that like, you know, everything's a risk, but the people who vibe with me will find me. And that's all I have to worry about. So, yeah, banner year. That's kind of my review. If you want to stay tuned with more videos to me, I know you'll probably at least get one video next year. You'll get my year in review video. Um, you might get some more videos in this YouTube channel. I don't know. I am not really focusing on YouTube, as I mentioned, but I do love creating. And if I ever have like six hours in a weekend, who knows what's going to happen. So uh, stay tuned. You might want to subscribe for that. And you'll certainly get more videos like this in the future, these year interviews. I, I think they're important for me to do. It kind of brings people together from different areas of my life, hopefully, slash maybe, and shares a bit of what I've learned and also gives me a chance to recap my own life. Because uh, holy crap, like, it just makes me emotional thinking about how far things have come. And if you're, like, wondering, like, are you able to like live your dreams? Are you able to do what you want to do with your life? I just have to say that like, I think, I think you're way more capable, way more brilliant, way more beautiful than you could ever realize. I believe that about all of you. I didn't believe that about myself. I don't fully believe that about myself, but I see every, every day that over the long time span of five to 10 years, just how much grander and better and happier my life is than I ever could have imagined ever could have imagined and I think sometimes when you go through hard stuff you know what it's like to have good stuff and I'm grateful that not only over the last five years have I gone through my own ups and downs in terms of learning about business and writing this industry but also I've gone through a lot of personal struggles that have helped me throughout this and honestly it was those personal struggles to begin with that inspired me to write 
I guess before I went to therapy, I wrote for my own therapy. So hopefully now I can write and be more therapeutic to others or at least helpful, maybe more like a coach or just a writing buddy, a storyteller friend. But regardless, I usually say on this channel, together we are boundless to end my videos. But since I know a lot of you watching are storytellers, I wanna say storytellers rule the world. So we'll end off with both of those and say that I hope that hearing what can happen in a year is inspiring. I hope hearing that someone can go to school, run a company, and create books while traveling and meeting great people can inspire you to go out and do the same no matter whatever stage of life that you're in. And, and to again, focus on doing everything for the people you love. And the people I love the most right now are my family, the people I work with, my friends, and storytellers. And that's why the storytellers of the world, baby. I'll be back next year. Hey.